Tensions between China and the United States were front and center at the Shangri-La Dialogue. So, what's the path forward? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The yearly security conference for the Asia-Pacific held in Singapore is known as the Shangri-La Dialogue. But there was not much dialogue, at least directly between China and the United States. Chinese State Councillor and Defence Minister Li Xiangfu elaborated on China's security initiative while warning against instability in the region. CGTN's Mira Lu reports. The world's attention shifted to Singapore on Sunday as China's Minister of National Defense, General Li Shangfu, took the stage at the Shangri-La Dialogue. His first speech to an international audience since taking office in March. Without naming the U.S., General Li accused what he termed as some country of interfering in the internal affairs of others. He further warned that a Cold War mentality greatly increases security risks in the Asia-Pacific. The true design of pushing for NATO-like military alliances in the Asia-Pacific is to hold countries in the region hostage and play up conflict and confrontation. Such attempts will only plunge the region into a whirlpool of division, disputes and conflicts. When he did name the U.S., he acknowledged that China-U.S. relations are at lowest point, but that the two big nations must find ways to get along. After his speech, General Li fielded several questions, including those around the recent encounters between Chinese and American militaries in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea. He pointed out the fact that all these activities or close encounters actually happen near China and not the other, the other way around. And if the foreign ships and aircraft do not come here for surveillance, reconnaissance or freedom of navigation, there won't be a security problem at all, right? The tricky thing is, everybody is talking about a UN Convention Law of the Sea, but people have a different understanding of what it really implies. Later in the day, the Chinese delegates held an open session where they answered pressing questions from the media and elaborated on the key messages from General Li's address. The Global Security Initiative is actually a concrete manifestation of the concept of building a community with a shared future for mankind. In terms of international security, advocating a common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security concept. The U.S. is challenging China's bottom line on the Taiwan question and the South China Sea issues. This not only shakes the political foundation of China-U.S. relations, but also creates a tense and intensified trend for the security situation in the region. At the other plenaries of the day, we heard viewpoints from Timor-Leste, Estonia, Germany, Cambodia and Singapore. At the concluding session, the Australian Defence Minister was seen trying to address concerns around mini-laterals by calling AUKUS a technology-transferring arrangement and called a practical engagement. Besides speeches and official engagements, another purpose of the Shangri-La Dialogue is to serve as a platform for off-spotlight, candid exchanges between defence officials. According to the organizer, IISS, at least 121 formal bilateral meetings took place this year. Those include the first defense ministerial talks between Japan and South Korea in over three years, and 11 bilaterals involving China. Miru, CGTN, Singapore. There is a lot to discuss. Let's bring in our panelists. Here in Washington, D.C., Saurabh Gupta is Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Also here in D.C., Anton Fedyoshin is a history professor at American University. Richard Haidarian is a senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines. He joins us from Manila. And from Beijing, Ina Tangan is senior fellow at the Taiha Institute. Welcome to all of you. Ina, this is called the Shangri-La Dialogue, but as I pointed out, there wasn't much dialogue taking place. China was very intent on uh, pointing out its security positions through the Global Security Initiative and its red lines as well. We heard officials there refer to U.S. meddling in the region and the abuse uh, 
of the so-called international rules-based order, which is abused by the West for its own benefits, and in many instances, those rules are broken. Um, listening to all of that, did you detect that we are now hearing from a China that is far more assertive uh, in its views, especially where it concerns security and its relationship to the United States? Yeah, I think the, the clear expression is that this is a bottom line, uh, a red line. Uh, Taiwan is not something that the U.S. should be using as some sort of uh, economic, political, military card. And, uh, you know, th this is the kind of thing that leads to problems. Uh, it's not just what was said at the dialogue or the fact that there wasn't anything said, you know, and a handshake is not a, uh, a discussion point. But, you know, China has real concerns about the sincerity of, of the U.S. And, you know, as you can see, you know, you had uh, Defense Secretary Austin saying things like, quote, but we will not flinch in the face of bullying or coercion, unquote. Uh, how ironic. Uh, it's the U.S. which is bullying countries into siding against uh, China, going around the world saying it's either with us or against us. I don't know how, how anybody could say, uh, you know, that coercion and uh, bullying is happening by China. I mean, this is a classic situation where the U.S. likes to accuse others of exactly what it is doing. And Anna, what did you make of the fact that we heard one of those senior Chinese military officials say there that relations between the two countries are probably at their lowest level? They are. I mean, it's, uh, it's recognizing the fact that it's also uh, a kind of wake-up call to Washington that this is not something uh, you use for the political uh, politics. This is not an election issue that you, you can just toss around. This is very serious. This is relationships between uh, two major powers. The U.S. is insisting that it needs to go into the backyard of China and, uh, you know, pose military threats. You know, imagine if the China was sailing ships up and down the east or west coast uh, in between Boston and Nantucket. I mean, they, there would be a, a wholesale call to war in the U.S., uh, but this inability to see the other side is exactly the problem. Trust is gone and uh, also uh, perspective. So uh, I don't know if this is going to be the wake-up call that makes it. Unfortunately, you know, we could run into an issue where there's going to be accidents. And the question is, will they escalate? Anton Fedyashin, of course, there was much said at those plenaries and those discussions that took place after the main speeches. This is how a Chinese lieutenant general characterized the United States' attitude towards China. Let's listen. Interaction should be sound and based on mutual respect. It would not work if the United States appeals for communication while undermining China's interests and claims to strengthen crisis management while continuing its provocations. And Anton, there was also an opinion piece in China Daily which said that the United States stretches one hand out for peace while it holds a gun in the other. You know, we just heard Anna Tangan talk a moment ago about sincerity. And is it fair to say that there's a lot of work that needs to be done here to build trust in this relationship? Uh, it's sure accurate to put it that way. The United States is um, uh, behaving um, as um, uh, most empires in human history have, as most great powers in human history have. Um, it uh, it uh, uh, pursues two policies at the same time. It positions itself as uh, uh, a bulwark for uh, peace, and at the same time, it uh, begins to divide the world into camps, uh, of one of which it sees itself as the leader. And that those are always policies that uh, work um, against themselves. Um, what is different in the current situation is that the United States seems to have um, sort of uh, dug this um, um, uh, paradox, uh, made it even more deep, because on the one hand, it is challenging China uh, constantly. And on the other hand, it expects China to support its policies on the war in Ukraine, which has always struck me as 
bizarre, and I'm putting that very mildly, because for the Chinese, who are supportive of Ukrainian sovereignty, for example, there's also the issue of NATO expansion towards Russia's borders, which is very important. And given that NATO, for example, has already stated publicly that it has plans and aspirations and hopes to um, become a Pacific player, I've always found it very strange that the United States expects Chinese support for its policies in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, for its pro-NATO, pro-expansion policy, and at the same time, it doesn't understand that the Chinese must understand that if they support NATO expansion in Europe, they will be on the receiving end of that expansion in the Pacific uh, eventually. I think the United States is trying to square a circle, mm -hmm. and so far it's been uh, devastatingly unsuccessful in doing so. Right, and Anton, uh, speaking of those contradictions, I mean, we often hear uh, the United States and its allies called for a reframing of this relationship, uh, something that will redefine the relationship. But then we also heard today from Germany that Germany will be entering the fray right now by sending two of its warships to the Indo-Pacific next year. What are we to make of that? Well, I, I, I think for the Biden administration, the reframing means uh, galvanizing and mobilizing the American-led alliance, which is NATO plus the, the states that are uh, dependent in terms of their security in the Pacific region dependent on their security on the United States. So that's the kind of reframing that the, U, that the Biden administration seems to have in mind. Uh, this is not the kind of reframing that I think will actually lead to stability. But listen, the bloc mentality is becoming more pronounced rather than less pronounced here in Washington. And so far, I see no signs of this changing unless the administration changes in 2024, but it's way too early mm -hmm. to predict what's going to happen in the election. Right. Richard Hedorian, great to have you with us. There is growing concern around the world, as we hear from analysts and commentators every day, that this rivalry or competition, call it what you will, between China and the United States could end up initially in a cold war and possibly in a hot war. Um, I mean, what is the feeling in the region? Yeah, I think the uh, intervention or the keynote speech by the Australian Prime Minister was quite important. Uh, and the emphasis there was the need for some sort of a guardrail, because we know that even at the height of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union and the United States had some very serious problems and actually even proxy wars throughout the post-colonial world, there was still a significant degree of communication channels, especially at the military-to-military -military level. And the sense is that that's not what we have right now. And I think what was quite worrying is that we don't even have an understanding on why the communication channels are not being restored. So the American side is blaming China, but the Chinese side is countering and saying, no, the problem is not with our side. The problem is more with the United States imposing illegal unilateral sanctions. And we're hearing more and more people, even in the United States, for instance, Max Booth at Washington Post just the other day was complaining that, you know, America is obsessed and addicted to sanctions against Russia, against Iran, against China. And this is not helping the situation. Well, the Biden administration is insisting that we should not impose preconditions for communications and that communication should happen regardless. Mm -hmm. So that's quite worrying for us, you know, as far as the relationship between the two powers concerned. At the same time, I think there was also a lot of emphasis on what so-called middle powers can do. You, you know, you saw as much as Australia is a U.S. ally or ASEAN has a number of countries like the Philippines, which are U.S. ally, they don't want this situation to continue and they want to nudge the two powers towards greater communications. In And in the meantime, engage both American-led and Chinese-led initiatives that point towards some sort of guardrail uh, otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble. I mean, in span of 10 days, we saw tensions between, um, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, fighter jet and, you know, an American reconnaissance or spy plane right. in the South China Sea. And then we also saw the similar situation in the sea. So from the skies to the seas, a hot war is very much a possibility. So we're at extremely troubled. Richard, uh, one other development, and you've been writing about this. You wrote a piece in the Asia Times in which you referenced the meeting between the defense ministers uh, of the United States, Australia, Philippines, and Japan. You call that meeting unprecedented, of huge symbolism, uh, with big operational implications. 
Um, it's sort of looking like, looking like an alternative quad, isn't it? Yeah, this is the this is so there are a lot of other minilateral arrangements that are coming out, and since President Marcus Jr.'s pivot towards the United States and you know return of a much more tense relationship with China, we see that the Philippines is now suddenly a new star ally of the United States, and now it's forming the linchpin of let's call it you know the other quad and in fact you could say this quad is more of a quad because unlike india mm -hmm. all of the countries involved here are u.s treaty ally and they seem to have a much more aligned view vis-a-vis -vis china the south china is the issue than let's say india for instance as part of the quad and later this year uh, there are hopes for uh, by these four countries to have joint patrols in the south china sea and greater intelligence sharing there was just a trilateral coast guard uh, you know, uh, exercise in Manila, Japan and the Philippines are looking at the visiting forces agreement. So the U.S. is also looking at the so-called integrated deterrence strategy, mm -hmm. working with uh, regional allies to keep China's ambitions in check. So this is another major, for me, uh, major outcome of the Shangri-La dialogue. Sarah Gupta, oh, you've been following developments in this region for a very long time. And when you see what is going on right now, when you hear the rhetoric on both sides uh, and you see the rising of tensions, uh, the United States often talks about strategic competition. But at, at its core, is this an effort by the United States to contain the rise of China? At some levels, yes, of course, it is about constraining the rise of China, and it's it's not just in the military dimension. We, as we've seen, most of the of that is actually happening in this administration in the in the in the in the technological and economic dimension. But what I see out here are two sides playing a fairly sophisticated game. What the United States is doing geopolitically vis-a-vis -vis China is having inducements with many of its allies and partners to tighten its relationship with them, with the implicit understanding that it's been tightened vis-a-vis -vis China. And once the US has tightened this, it's trying to maintain a certain stability in relations with China. So these countries will all have bad relations or not good relations with China, while the United States will manage a sort of a working relationship with China. That's where Biden is trying to go we talking about guardrails, et cetera, et cetera. Meantime, we have China, which has essentially, more or less, I would say, given up on the United States. It's trying to stabilize relationship at its at the least worst level. It had hoped to have a deep cooperative relationship with the US just for its own development, as well as to stabilize the region. It knows it's not going to get that. And so for the United for for, for China. Its most important geopolitical partner is Russia. Its mm. most important geoeconomic partner is the European Union. The U.S. is nowhere out here. It has a dilemma right now because Russia and the Europe are, are at loggerheads, and that's where the delicate dance at the Chinese end is. So both sides are working with looking at other players while they know that they need to maintain some, dig, some semblance of management of their relationship. But the terms of how to manage that relationship is something which uh, which is hard to come by and has been hard to come by for some time. So, so would you say then that China is, um, has more leverage right now if it sees Russia as its most important strategic partner and the EU as its most important economic strategic partner? China will have that leverage if it can work that relationship with the EU right. Mm -hmm. That's still a work in progress. It's just thawing. That, I think this decision had been made at the last year of the Trump administration itself, where, they, where China was very forthcoming in trying to sign the comprehensive agreement on investment. It would never be the case that such an important agreement, would, if in the past would have been first signed with the Americans, then multilateralized. I think the decision to go with Europe was a very important one. Mm. But of course, then we had COVID, we had Uyghur genocide allegations, then we've had the Russia war. So that relationship is difficult to work. But if China can really work that relationship right, or get it to be a productive one with Europe, I think China will have a fair amount of leverage. And I think in the Asian region itself, it has reasonable relations mm. with, with, uh, with ASEAN. And it's, it's managing with the other countries, tight, difficult, diff, difficult relations. But I think China understands one thing right. There is no Indo-Pacific. There's a Western Pacific and there's an Indian Ocean. Yeah. And it treats the two theaters separately. And it works its arrangements out in that regard.
Ina Tang, and getting back to you know what I was talking to Richard Hedarian about a moment ago, and that was that meeting between the United States Defense Secretary uh, and his Australian, uh, Japanese, and Philippines counterparts. Uh, what are the implications of that for China? Well, unfortunately, what we have are the shadows of World War I. Uh, back then, it was Great Britain, a massive power trying to contain the rise of Germany. So they used these, both sides were using all these kinds of uh, uh, alliances in order to avoid war, but it actually led to them. Uh, China's not doing any kind of military alliance, but the U.S. is pursuing the same path. So at this time, you have a situation where the U.S. is trying to repeat history, and I'm absolutely blind to the implications that it is. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think China does have to be more creative. Uh, the U.S. has been singing the same song yeah. uh, all these years. Look at Cuba. Sanctions, 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 nothing has changed. Mm. And this is just the U.S. playbook. So instead of uh, waiting for the U.S. to do these kinds of things. I think China should do as it is by reaching out and making by example, leading by example in terms of trying to create peace wherever it can, whether it's in the Middle East or uh, in Ukraine. But I disagree that uh, Europe is uh, China's biggest hope. It's actually ASEAN. Uh, and that's where the the trade is. It's the fastest growing segment, and it will continue to be the largest. I think uh, the world is splitting up into economic zones, uh, and uh, China at this point is winning that because it's not asking any country to side with it. It's just simply saying, can we trade? Richard, recently uh, there was an agreement between the Philippines and uh, the United States, which. Uh, will establish four more uh, U.S. bases in the Philippines. Um, what can you tell us about that? Uh, and also part of that plan is to quote the United States, is to increase interoperability between the United States and Philippines armed forces. I mean, what do you read into that? Does this tell us that the Philippines actually sees its security interests firmly within the United States sphere rather than China? Yeah, that's a, that's a very important point. I mean, first of all, these are sites. So some of these are not really bases out there. These are, they're strategically important sites and strategically important because they're close to uh, Taiwan. But it remains to be seen if America is in a position to put billions of dollars to actually build huge bases that it used to have in the Philippines. Although, of course, they're not allowed to have permanent bases. They're supposed to have rotational bases in the Philippines. So there's a lot of vagueness around that. There's also a lot of, I would say, hesitance on the part of President Marcos Jr. to fully align with the United States. And that explains why he repeatedly before meeting, uh, you know, Biden in the White House and visiting uh, the Pentagon last month. And right after that, he always said, we don't want this to be used for offensive operations, of course, with the Taiwan situation uh, in mind. And I don't think he's being disingenuous. I think he's, he's genuinely concerned that in his attempt to have more American support to strengthen position vis-a-vis -vis China, he doesn't burn bridges with China. Because I think the Philippines still wants to maintain yeah. a, a communication channel with China and good trade and investment relation. So I think things are still in play, but obviously the Philippines is not where it used to be when we had President Duterte, who clearly did not want to align with the United States at all and prioritize relations with China. Anton, uh, there are some analysts who think that this has got a lot more, uh, it appears to be a lot more than just a military buildup in Southeast Asia or strategic interests. Uh, there was an opinion piece in the Financial Times written by its uh, foreign affairs columnist, Gideon Rachman, and he said that the United States is planning a complete reworking and recasting of the current international political, economic, and military order. And to quote him here very quickly, he said, the United States intends to use a new strategic industrial policy to simultaneously revitalize the American middle class and U.S. democracy while combating climate change and establishing a lasting technological lead over China. Um, it also called for uh, supply chain diversity. I mean, is this what it's all about? It is what it's all about, and I follow Gideon Rachman's uh, work fairly closely, and I usually, by the way, disagree with him, but I think he's got his uh, finger right on the button here. 
but here's the important thing. Uh, Gideon Rackman seems to think that uh, this policy is going to be a blessing for the rest of the planet, but this policy is fundamentally American-centered. Now, look, there's nothing inherently wrong with this. It'll, it would be strange if the United States pursued policies that favored other countries above itself. Um, but remember, everyone was horribly critical of Donald Trump's economic nationalism. Well, the Biden administration is pursuing exactly that. Um, it is pursuing a policy of de-risking, which means that it will be creating its own economic super bloc, but it will be centered on the United States. Um, the U.S. leading a bloc is nothing new of its own during the Cold War. That was exactly what the uh, First World uh, was in the old First, Second, and Third World schema of the Cold War. But the difference back then is that the United States was profoundly interested in having economically successful and thriving uh, satellites, um, especially in Europe. When you look at how the European economies are performing these days, it's and what they're complaining about, by the way, which is a gradual deindustrialization, mm. in part because of American policies, it's hard to see the same kind of commitment to the whole camp uh, profiting. And I imagine that uh, wise people uh, in the Pacific and uh, 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 Indian Ocean region who are looking at the United States and its conduct towards its European allies, I mean economic conduct, may well ask themselves whether this kind of American-centric economic model is going to benefit them the same way that it benefits the United States. And there's a reason why there are almost 30 nations in line to become members of the BRICS um, uh, uh, not alliance, but yeah. the BRICS group. And that is because everyone is looking for alternative. Everyone is de-risking. So, Gupta, very quickly, I've got less than a minute. You know, Anton there speaks of de-risking. That's, of course, the U.S. lessening its reliance uh, on China. Of course, China is one of the, the most important, if not the most important, link in the international supply chain. I mean, do you see that changing in the short term? No, I don't see that changing in the short term. I don't see that changing in the long term either, except for certain high technology goods where the U.S. may be able to build out supply chains which are decoupled from China. Otherwise, China will be at the heart of supply chains. And coming back to your previous point, the problem with the American approach is there was a day when America could provide security and engender prosperity. The day has passed when it could engender prosperity. It can just provide security. And when people re realize that, they will say, if you can just destroy, but you cannot build, then we won't allow you to destroy too. And that's the dilemma America faces. It needs to learn to engender prosperity around the world. OK, that's where we need to leave it. Thank you to all of you for being with us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. The conversation continues online. Join us on CGTN America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C.